Richard Vobes is a popular YouTube conspiracy vlogger. He has a channel with over 200,000 subscribers, and he goes by the name The Bold Explorer. His channel, it's, it's mostly interview format, and he features a collection of characters, including Gary Waterman. Remember, the former police officer turned recent Christian and now a revealer of the great truths that, as to the, the, the root cause of mankind's misery. That, that guy, he's been on the Richard Vobes show three times. And what about Peace Officer Davey, the, the personal finance guru whose advice is so bad that he will leave you penniless and almost certainly destitute. So you get the idea. Richard tends to include very unsavory characters as guests on his show. And the audience that tunes into that absolutely loves that because there's a certain kind of truther who absolutely loves to be lied to by idiots. And that's what Richard delivers in abundance. But not every show is an interview show. Sometimes Richard likes to give I guess lectures. Lectures about topics that he has turned his brilliant and pulsating mind towards. Uh, they could be topics like current affairs. He, he recently did one uh, about the war in Ukraine. And uh, clue, he loves himself some Vladimir Putin, and don't we all? Um, but what about uh, 5G? It will come as absolutely no surprise to you to learn that Richard Vobes is an anti-5G conspiracy theorist. I think he believes that 5G is a weapon, or it's harmful, or maybe it's been not properly tested by the various companies, or, or something. He's never entirely clear about which of the very many competing conspiracy theories about 5G he personally believes in. Perhaps he believes in them all, because that's generally the way that conspiracy theorists operate. But it was on one of his lectures about 5G that he decided to educate the audience about the, the, the mysteries and intricacies of radio frequency radiation, a subject which he clearly knows absolutely nothing at all about. But that never seems to stop conspiracy theorists. In, in fact, total ignorance of subjects is one of the prerequisites before they begin to speak about it. That's just how they work. But how we work is when we see a conspiracy theorist talking utter twaddle on the internet. It's an opportunity to reform the band. And the band I'm speaking of are the real engineers who love to react to conspiracy nonsense on the internet. And the first of those real engineers is my dear friend Chris. So please, introduce yourself. Hi, my name's uh, Chris Street. Um, I work as a civil servant. Um, don't hold that against me. But before that, um, I have um, degrees in electronics, engineering, chemistry, astronomy. I'm a licensed radio amateur. Um, I work in IT. Um, and uh, I do quite a lot of um, radio um, experimentation and engineering as part of being a radio amateur. So that's me. The second real engineer is my good friend Lee from Lee's Laboratory. And that, apparently, that's a YouTube channel, although I don't think he's updated it much recently. Lee, go and make some more YouTube. It was fun. Well, um, Lee, go and introduce yourself, please. I'm Lee Porter. I work for a uh, research and development engineering company. Uh, my background is radio communications, internet engineering and electronics. And our final real engineer is none other than MC Toon, who is, of course, famous on the internet for being the bane of flat earthers. The, the, the man who has taken down more flat earthers in debate than, than anybody I know, and who has been uh, an absolute treasure, and, and perhaps uh, the, the underlying instigator of this channel. That's right. Without MC Toon, there would be no Mind of Steel. And so, MC Toon, please introduce yourself. What, what kind of real engineer are you? My real engineering is software engineering, though I have st I did study at university electrical engineering, but I did not pursue a career in that. And finally, just some full disclosure, although I did begin a degree in electronic engineering, I switched to software engineering, which was much more my kind of thing. I actually have a degree in computer science. Uh, and now I, I shall leave it to my beloved audience to, uh, to argue amongst yourselves is computer science or software engineering a legitimate and actual form of engineering? Or are we merely pretenders to that title, uh, since we tend not to have to do really hard engineering things like um, calculus? Uh, th that is for you to decide. Now, 
on to the very first clip from Richard Vobes. Do you remember the old long wave? You know, in the old days, back when you had the BBC going, this is the BBC Home Service. Now, long wave, this is a wave, a radio wave, and it, it went like this. It sort of went up and down as a, as a like in a wave on the ocean, if, but very long, low powered, still radiation, but so low you wouldn't even notice it had no, no harmful effect. And we've had this for years and we know that it's perfectly safe. So what do you think about what Richard Vogues is saying about long wave? Is it perfectly safe? Well, it's perfectly safe. I'd take disagreement with the fact that he says it's very low power, because long wave transmitters are some of the most powerful radio transmitters we actually have on the planet. <laughs> So I'm not quite sure where he got that from. I mean, um, BBC Radio 4 Longwave was 500 kilowatts, I think, from down near Droitwich. Radio Warsaw used to be 2 megawatts, which is quite large and still doesn't seem to have any real effect on people. Well, that's just the UK. So that some stations in other countries, particularly Russia, there's some of the propaganda stations, uh, they were certainly many megawatts. I think that he has confused... Uh, frequency with power and and completely mis misunderstands that that uh, the frequency makes it safe or unsafe but in reality it's the amount of power that makes it safe or unsafe well i wouldn't say it's necessarily the amount of power it's how much power is absorbed by the body that makes yes. it safe or unsafe and the thing about long waves is he's certainly right long wave radiation radio is wavelengths of many kilometers and Generally speaking, things will only interact with the human body if they're about the same length or a, a significant fraction shorter than it. So a thing that a quarter of the way through the body, halfway length of the body. But your average man's two meters tall, you've got a wavelength of two kilometers. Just has no effect whatsoever. Nothing. The signal would sit, as I understand it, on the radio wave. So the you've got the wave, let's call that like the sea, and then the signal would sit on it like a boat or a series of boats. And you hear what's in the boat, as in the bloke talking from the BBC, and the wave is just the carrier. I think he's trying to describe amplitude modulation. I'm not quite sure I agree with his analogy there, because the, um, the idea of the boat riding on it doesn't quite work for AM. Uh, no, what actually yeah. happens is <laughs> The, the, the amplitude, so the power, literally, of the signal increases and decreases uh, with your speech. So as I'm speaking now, you can imagine the amplitude going up and down as I speak, and that's how amplitude modulation works. So I, I'm not, I don't quite get what he means with this analogy of the boat riding on a wave. He said there might be lots of boats riding, riding on a wave, and, and your, your voice, the signal, is inside the boat. Yeah, he kind of um, gets the idea that amplitude is something that you do to the wave, but he's entirely wrong in almost every single aspect of his um, answer. Mm. I think would be the best way of putting it. But I suppose what he's trying to get across is that, that the modulation, what, what, what the information the wave carries and the wave are two separate entities. Yes. Uh, that might be what he's trying to yeah. get, get across. I, I, th I think he knows where he wants to go. He just doesn't understand the mechanism behind it, but he's perfectly correct in saying that there is something that sits on a carrier wave, which is what we call the um, the base signal. It is a carrier wave. Richard seems to have a vague idea of what he's saying. Mm. Uh, and the fact that he hasn't really done that much research, or all of the knowledge he might have may have been gleaned secondhand when he was a 12-year-old child, that doesn't seem to stop him putting together a 25-minute presentation on this subject for his uh, adoring YouTube audience. Yeah. Now, you're probably more familiar with medium wave back in the days when you could get FM and things like that. And the thing about medium wave is you would have not just one or two big transmitters, you'd have slightly smaller transmitters and they would be closer together, about 20 or 30 miles apart. Medium wave transmitters, slightly smaller, 20 or 30 miles apart. Is that how it is with medium wave transmitters? Uh, no. <laughs> What, what he's probably trying to say is a medium long wave. You might have one long wave transmitter like, like the uh, sort of BBC World Service, which covers a large proportion of the Earth's surface. You know, so maybe continent, continental Europe, for example. And then medium wave is normally more localized stations. So you might have like eleven fifty two used to be so that's some sort, sort of talk radio station, and you might get two of those transmitters in the UK: one covering one area, and one covering another area with a different radio station. Uh, mm. Now, sometimes 
the atmospherics would cause issues and th that wouldn't work very well at all. But I suppose the idea he, he's trying to get across now is that the shorter the wavelength, generally the lower the coverage area. But 20 to 30 miles? No. No. Nowhere near. Also, yeah. it's interesting, he says that you've got one big long wave transmitter and lots of little medium wave ones. But I thought long wave was the low power one, so surely you'd have more of those than medium wave if it's low power. I think he's yeah. still confused about power and frequency, though. Mm. He's not internally consistent, and no. these things should be obvious to anyone who's actually gifted in engineering or science, and I don't think they are. Oh, he's him. not. Richard is an actor, and he tends not to feature anyone with any real expertise at all on his show. At least, that's that's not his concept of an expert. No, but if he's pronouncing himself as an expert and vague person what he knows about, he should be able to spot inconsistencies like this himself. Then you had short wave, smaller waves, not like microwaves, still much, much bigger than microwaves. But the thing about short waves and all radio waves is they're going out in straight lines like this. Well, the thing about short waves is the frequency of which the wave was, it would go up into the atmosphere, it would bounce off that and come back down. Um, well, uh, I think he's got it quite a bit wrong. Uh, higher frequency doesn't bounce off the ionosphere as well as lower frequency, somewhere between 30 and 40 megahertz that it bounces off the ionosphere. I don't know if he's in his head, he's up to that frequency range yet because he's a little ambiguous about long wave, short wave, medium wave. Why don't we just define some of these things? So he's yeah. introduced some of these traditional radio concepts, or at least broadcast radio concepts. We're all familiar with radio dials that have, have a selector for long wave, medium wave, and short wave. Is that a UK thing? Yeah, that's a UK thing. So it's okay. like a, a radio yeah. set in the UK might have a, a selector that allows you to, to change between three modes of reception that approximately oh. correspond between the, the frequency bands that, that the dial will change. Okay. So, um, we just have to talk about wavelengths, they're not frequency bands. This is where the problem comes in. So we have long wave, which is stuff from, and it's kind of ill-defined, I suppose from about, oh, would you say, Isley, from about 500 metres and longer? Yeah, so, 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 uh, yeah. Uh, I'd say up to about megahertz. Yeah, um, because when radio waves first came out, they measured them in meters, but then they switched to frequencies, and then they defined frequency bands. So yeah, it all gets kind of confusing, uh, which is what he's confusing there. But I mean, going back to what he was saying, I mean, first of all, he says that radio waves go in a straight line. So they only go in a straight line in a vacuum. Is the first thing to realize. Um, and you know, you get a satellite dish made of metal. You can absolutely bounce radio waves off that. That's not that's not a problem. Um, yeah. I mean, depending on everything from the activity of the sun, the time of day, the amount of water in the upper atmosphere, you can get um, ionospheric scatter and um, propagation anywhere from well, about three and a half megs up to thirty to thirty-five megs quite reliably. You can even get something called sporadic E that will take you all the way up to what. 70 75 megs yeah. you won't go over the atlantic on it but you can go a very long way over continental europe with it and just to play that's sporadic key that's a, a a sort of it's a it's an environmental condition that doesn't always exist it's it's an unusual yes. weather condition that allows radiation of certain wavelengths to propagate far more effectively right yeah and so sporadic key season is about now in fact and it's to do with the e layer of the atmosphere and to be honest, no one really knows quite what's going on, which is part of why we do experimentation, of course. Is that is that related to tropospheric ducting? No, that... tropospheric ducting is much lower down, and that's where you get a duct of a certain temperature or pressure in the troposphere. And that can be quite impressive. I've had that before on two metres, 144 megs, where by the top of the hill I could talk to the south of France from the UK because I'm in the duct. The bottom of the hill can maybe talk 10 miles. Yeah, it can be quite specific. It's, there's lots of different phenomena for radio propagation, and we could spend hours talking about them. I, so what, I, I think what so think... far, Richard is doing okay for for somebody with absolutely no technical background. He's, I think he's he's approximately right, but um, I mean, just it's just a little bit bizarre seeing somebody trying to explain these technical concepts who clearly has no actual technical idea. 
I, yeah. I, um, I yes. think he's, yeah, fair enough. I think he's building up to something, right? He's, he's taking this foundation that so far is good enough, right? We, we kind of struggle a little bit with his details, but it's good enough. But I know that he's leading to something where he's going to get it wrong. I think he's going to be leading up to something that's going to involve the frequencies, because apparently always high frequencies are the dangerous ones. I think that looks like the, the trajectory. Yeah, that's where we're going. We're going to, to, it's going to be 5G, isn't it? So that's on 3G and 4G. And the thing about having a smaller radio wave is that you can put more data on it, particularly the digital data, so that you can download your movies and you can download uh, your WhatsApp messages and send emails and all of that on these shorter wavelengths. Now, I do remember from my electronic engineering classes about the work of, of that great engineer and scientist, Shannon, who, uh, who did point out that higher frequency signals can indeed carry data at higher bit rates. But th that's not really practically how it works in the real world, because we almost never use a single frequency to, to carry any kind of digital signal, do we? If you look at um, home Wi-Fi, for example, let's take an example there. Your 2.4 gigs, your, you know, your early Wi-Fi, has um, a channel width of maybe 20 megahertz. Um, now, that 20 megahertz channel width lets you shove data up at whatever the maximum limit is, 54 megabits a second or something. You go to 5G. 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi. Yeah, 5 gigahertz. That'll have a bandwidth of um, 80 megs, and you can shove data up there a lot faster, about 860 megabits a second. We use bandwidth casually to, to mean really the amount of data that you could squirt down some kind of link. But in radio engineering, bandwidth has a very specific meaning, doesn't it? So bandwidth in radio engineering is the amount of spectrum uh, that you're using. So you might use, for example, between 2.4 and 2.5 gigahertz. That's 100 megahertz of bandwidth, uh, radio bandwidth. And in that channel, you have something then called the baud rate, which is how many different symbols uh, per second are doing things which is carrying your data. So you might have a 20 megahertz channel width, 20 megahertz bandwidth, uh, which is the amount of spectrum you're using, but the baud rate might be massive, uh, in which case you can carry maybe two, three, four hundred megabits per second of traffic. And the baud rate depends on what kind of modulation scheme you're using. That's where it gets a bit more complex then. Uh, so modulation schemes are the really, really important bit. Because you could have a lower frequency with a really clever modulation scheme and transmit more data faster than a higher frequency with a really poor modulation scheme. And that's taking us very close to what MC Toon just predicted, because um, isn't that the case with 5G? 5G does uh, tend to use higher frequencies, but it doesn't have to. In the UK, I recently read that, um, that uh, 4G uses uh, a band that starts from 800 megahertz and goes up for a certain amount, the 5G lower band actually starts at 700 megahertz. And that is the, the main data carrier band for 5G if you're not in some very built up area, some urban space. And that's clearly faster than 4G, despite the fact that it's using uh, a band that is at a lower frequency of, you know, almost 100 megahertz. Yeah, Canada is similar. It's 500 or 600 megahertz in Canada. You had asked earlier about encoding data or putting data in the signal. And, and so a, a way to think of that uh, amplitude mo modulation is, is just say each, each wave is a little higher or a little lower than than a, a baseline. And if it's higher, you could say that's a one. And if it's lower, you could say that's a zero. It's a very crude way to describe how to do it, but uh, that's a, a way to understand how you might encode data. But then uh, you could encode more data. You could say, well, two steps higher is, is, a, is a two and two steps lower is a three. And so then you can get, you know, zero, one, two, three in, in that same, amount of of uh, uh, bandwidth. When that transition is more complex, uh, you need a better quality signal. Because you imagine you have a signal that's either on or off, like Morse code. So, da-da-da-da-da-da-da. That's really, really simple. It's either there or it isn't there. 
Uh, if you do what, what you're saying, um, MC2, where you have different levels of signal, which represent different bit patterns or, or different symbols you're trying to send, when if your signal is quite poor, uh, then trying to dis distinguish between those gets more and more difficult. So the more data you want to try and transmit, the better quality signal you need. And that's where Shannon's law starts to uh, uh, really become appropriate. So this is a Nyquist limit, isn't it, ultimately? So there's a huge network of of mobile phone transmitters all over the place. Your town might have two or three, depending on the size of the town. I may have got some of these figures a little bit wrong, but best bear with me. The principle, I'm sure, is pretty accurate. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> looking <laughs> around where I am, I've probably got two that are within five miles of me. So he's talking uh, oh. still 3G, 4G. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I it, it depends. Uh, I suppose a, a little hamlet in the countryside of, of uh, England land might have just one or two. We might have one or two, but then we, remember there's going to be multiple operators. So we have EE, uh, O2, 3, Vodafone. So there might be one, but it might have four operators on. Uh, so then, then literally it's, it's going to be four really. And they might all run 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. So, in reality, you, you say you have one, it might be one location, uh, but there's lots of things happening on there as well. We have multiple ma um, transmitters on each mast. I mean, the nearest one to yeah. me has got at least eight to ten collinear antennas on it. So there's going to be multiple radios in the cabinet beneath it for sure. Yeah, I think this, this goes to maybe Richard misunderstanding precisely what these things on the masts are and it's very tempting to, to look at a mast and think of it as being a single machine but it's actually a, a scaffolding that a bunch of different telecoms providers yes. are renting little spots on both on the the frame of the the tower and also in the cabinets at its base that mm. it's, it's a it's a whole cooperation of different machines by different companies isn't it yeah. it, it does it does um show the the he, how he went from the beginning where he was talking about radio transmitters to, you know, just receive only radios to cell phones where it's two way and it's higher frequency, higher bandwidth and all that, that I don't think he got that transition. I think he missed it. The one thing you can't have if you're a 5G truther is a sense of perspective. And we began by talking about the long wave transmitters, which range in maybe 500 kilowatts all the way to two megawatts. Um, by comparison, how powerful are the transmitters on a typical cell phone tower? 40 watts, 100 watts. So let's put that into perspective that. For, for somebody who maybe can't count watts. Um, <laughs> like a, an average light bulb in, in, a, in a typical home, that might be 50 to 100 watts if it's a, a filament bulb. And uh, a candle, a wax candle, I, I believe that puts out somewhere between 80 and 100 watts of power. Does that seem reasonable? Uh, well, it depends. So uh, uh, an old lamp, lamp for your the incandescent lamps, it might be 100 watts, but a lot of that is going to be heat. Uh, so in reality, you might get maybe 20 watts of light. So you, you think about LED lights, which are a lot more efficient, even have a, a, a 9, 10 watt LED light. There, there's 10 watts of LED light. And so far, seems to be okay. Let's put this even more into perspective because uh, the quanta of energy emitted by that LED light you were just holding, well, that's emitting visible light, which mm. is, um, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm correct, many thousands of times more energetic per quantum than the, <laughs> the energy being emitted from a cell phone tower or, or the phone much, in your hand. Absolutely, much, yeah. Yes. Much shorter wavelength. Yeah. The, the visible and, light is just at the point where you can actually consider it to be almost ionizing radiation. Um, so if it wasn't ionizing radiation, you wouldn't be able to see anything because that's how your eyeballs work. And so if, if Richard's theory was correct, like we should be absolutely terrified of visible light because visible light is higher energy, shorter wavelength, far more energetic than the, the, the kind of light that might come off um, a two megawatt long wave transmitter. But what would you rather stand in front of? That uh, tiny little LED lantern or the uh, the gigantic BBC World Service transmitters. I'll turn that one around slightly on you. I'd rather stand in front of um, the BBC World Service transmitters at many megawatts than take a hundred watts of ultraviolet, which is just above visible. Because mm. a hundred watts of ultraviolet 
for not very long will give you skin cancer. But you won't get that standing in front of a radio transmitter from the BBC. Now, the thing about the 5G is that even shorter now, much, much shorter. It's microwave. Now, I don't know who invented the microwave, but it's a clever invention using these tiny, tiny waves. A microwave might be a millimetre. So instead of a long wave being like this, you know, nice, gentle, sloping, sweeping thing, these are really, really tiny, going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down like this. Who invented the microwave? Can anyone answer that question? What, what a clever person. person. Oh my gosh. You're right. It, it's guy, getting worse. Yes, yeah, no the name of Heinrich Hirsch was the guy who discovered, I don't think he invented it didn't, the microwave. It didn't Heinrich invent Hirsch. it. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's be clear that microwaves have existed for the entire duration of the universe. <laughs> and and yeah. per perhaps the, the first ever microwaves were created in the cosmic Big Bang, for, for those people who are viewing and believe that that was indeed the, the origin of our universe as we know it. And uh, microwaves, I believe, are emitted constantly by our sun. Just, I, I believe they, they, they just don't all get through, thanks to uh, the, the, the beautiful atmosphere that we should cherish. Now, um, Heinrich Hertz discovered microwaves and was actually doing experiments with them in the 1800s at 450 megs and demonstrated diffraction and reflection and everything else. And that's how they found out that radio waves are, well, waves. <laughs> what, what about and, uh, the fact that they're going up and down, up and down, up and down? They're not this, really. Like I said, we're going for the frequencies, aren't we? They're not really. It's, you know, it's a conceptual way to think about it. But but mm. photons don't don't travel in the ways that we can really think about. It's just ways that people use to describe how it works. I mean, you've also got an, an electric field and a magnetic field that are at right angles to each other. And you mean it might be going left and right, left and right, left and right? It's kind Indeed. of like it's sort of like pulses in and out and in and out. It's, no, it's quantum uh, mechanics, uh, and as someone once said, if you haven't understood, if you understood quantum mechanics, then clearly you haven't studied it well enough. I mean, I understand about the quantum field mechanics. <laughs> I, I think we need some definitions now as well. Uh, yes. So, so we've done long wave, medium wave. We did we? Really we sort of stopped then. So then yeah, we have short wave. So let's define short wave for, for Richard. So, so <laughs> short wave is between about three and, and 30 megahertz or so. Uh, then VHF is, is, this is all very rough. Yeah, you know, And people define these slightly differently. VHF starts at about that sort of 30 megahertz and goes up to about, what do you reckon, Chris, 400 or so, 300 or so. It's 30 to 300 and then yeah. UHF is 300 to um, three gigs. And then microwave is three gigs to 30 gigs. Yes. So, so when he says that 5G is microwave, uh, it, it isn't. 5G is, uh, can operate on any spectrum between, well, anyway. 500 it, it, megahertz. It, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but yeah, but typically defined between about 500 megahertz and up to wherever it ends. So, 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 like, like I think the highest is 42 gigahertz or so. Uh, but 5G isn't necessarily a microwave. In fact, most 5G currently is 5 to 600 megahertz, 800. Uh, most of it is about 3.5 gigahertz, which, you know, I mean, you can call that microwave. Would it be safe to say that 5G, I mean, 5G doesn't relate to frequency. 5G is the definition of a communications protocol. Yes, it's nothing to do it with frequency. It just happens to run on radio waves. You could run it on a laser if you wanted to, I'm fairly well, certain. It, it's <laughs> important to, to, to remember that some of the... Uh, installations of 5G are lower frequency than 3G and 4G. Yes, yes. And, and he, he's completely yeah. missed that, absolutely. Uh, and 2G. Yes. Yes, because there was 2G, 1800 megs, wasn't there in the UK? Yeah, no, yeah. Indeed. But, but let's the be same, clear here, it? because it, it seems to me that the thing that Richard is objecting to isn't so much the content of 5G, the, the protocol, the specification of 5G. He's concerned about the frequencies or the frequency bands that 5G may have been allocated to in certain countries. And he has no idea what frequencies are have been used or will be used by 5G. But the problem is that there are no new frequencies, that the frequencies that 5G currently uses in the UK, the US and Canada, well, before 5G, those frequencies were used for something else. 3.5 gigahertz uh, was first used in the UK in about 1995 by a company called Ionica. Uh, to deliver phone services. Uh, they, they didn't do too well. Uh, no, I remember that. It was that. used. So 
it, it's not new in, in any way whatsoever. Well, I mean, technically speaking, three to four gigs was used in the mid 1940s for radar. We, we got microwave radar towards the end of the war, and that's when we first started seriously using microwaves in the UK. And it still is. I remember I was um, part of an organisation called the WiMAX Forum, uh, which was before before three G and four G were really a thing. This was going to be one of the new ways we did mobile communications, and we wanted to use three point five gigahertz. And we had this big conference, and this this lovely American chap, this general with all his all his regalia on, or you know, they have his little like red and pink dots and things. What are they? The little squares they have. Uh, and all these medals and things. Whatever it is, yeah. He got up to do his grand speech, and he would, he wanted the entire world to not use 3.5 gigahertz for WiMAX or anything else, uh, because as a policeman of the entire world, they use it for their radar, and they're worried about it. Well, that um, does remind me that um, wasn't the a, a bit of a scare at the beginning of the deployment of 5G that um, one of the bands used by 5G was adjacent to one of the FAA-approved bands that was used for air-to-ground radar. And people were very yes. much yeah. concerned that yeah. the, the launch of 5G might cause planes to literally drop out of the sky because this mm. adjacent frequency might cause a badly calibrated radar to, to misreport the, the plane's altitude. Yeah, th there were, it was in the United States, of course, and uh, in the end, nothing was changed and no planes fell out of the sky. No, no crashes happened. It was, it really is about whether or not radios are doing what they are supposed to do. So radios are supposed to not transmit outside of their range that they're allocated range. But of course, it's it's truly impossible to have a, a uh, perfect drop off. You get to the edge of your range and then it drops off at a certain slope. And it depends on a lot of things, how steep that slope is. And it's more expensive and more complicated to make the slope steeper. So when you when you design something, if it's not well designed, it might slop out of that a little bit uh, because that slope isn't quite steep enough and you're sending garbage off into the the buffer zone be between them or you might also be reading data or in you know signals that have been spilled into your slope or into that buffer area because you're also not quite uh, filtering your signal good enough so either of those could do it well the 5g stuff is is newer uh, hardware and generally aren't having those types of problems the faa things at airports are older a lot of these have been installed for a long time and they had sometimes some issues with uh potentially not really i don't think there was anything that really happened but there was some potential that they could be getting some interference and that was you it. Make a show about this uh, three years ago, MC Two. I think you did, didn't you? Uh, I, your, I mentioned your episode it, yeah. all about uh, Sabina, the, uh, the the physicist who uh, who who claimed that five G might just be dangerous. And that was about weather satellites, and it's essentially the same thing. It was about frequency bands that weather satellites were using to measure something on the mostly on the oceans. <laughs> and also in the in the non-populated areas, but mostly the oceans where yes. there's no 5G installed. All of that is radiation, and the smaller the, rave, the wavelength, the more radiation. Even at a lower power, it's still going to be radiating. So that's. I told you it was frequencies. I told you it would be the frequencies, didn't it's I? So stupid. Yeah, I'm Shut sorry. Shut but... up, Richard. You know nothing. If that high frequency is bad. And I'll try to even say, prove it. T tell me why it's not safe to stand in front of a 2.4 microwave, 2.4 gig microwave oven with the door open and the safety is locked out. But then tell me why it's safe to stand in front of a 5 gig transmitter at the same. If you were to stand in front of a microwave oven with a faulty safety device, you'd probably start feeling a bit warm. Oh, it'd cook your eyeballs and give you cataracts for a start. Oh, yeah, yeah. If yeah. you're close. Well, it depends how close you are, it depends yeah. how direction it is. But, you know, you have the same power level at 5 gigs, you won't even notice it. Because it just doesn't interact with you. If you start going up in frequency, you will get to the point where it will start interacting with you and it will start ionising the cells in your body. And it's called ultraviolet radiation. But that's yeah. so much higher in frequency than anything to do with radio waves. It's just... 
it makes no sense at all what he's saying. He said, <laughs> even if it's lower power, it's still more radiation. That's what he said, right? Yeah. And yes. that is a, absolutely the opposite of correct. If it's if it's less power, it's it's in general. There's caveats in general, safer. And and the frequency at past a certain frequency range, our bodies uh, don't interact with it well until you get way past on the other side of optical. So none of what he is saying it makes sense at all. And and he should really stop pontificating on this topic. I hope he wears suntan cream when he goes out on a sunny day, because I'm sure on his head. The, 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 yes, I mean. Yeah. A, a sunny day is really quite intense radiation, even in our mostly overcast United Kingdom. Do you want to know what the biggest source of microwave and milliwave radiation in the UK is, or anywhere else on the planet? Sorry. It's that unshielded nuclear reactor in the sky that's 93 million miles away. Somebody should do something about that. Yeah. Now you're, now you're now getting to the chemtrails conspiracy. Let's not it's, go there. We've never had a situation in which... So many radio waves, microwaves, are being transmitted 24-7 all the time. Um, I mean, before we started transmitting radio waves, there were less of them. The biggest <laughs> source, of source of them on the UK, or anywhere in the world for that matter, would have been thunderstorms and solar radiation. But yes, we have a small percentage amount more now that we're transmitting it. But it's a small percentage of the total. Doesn't that depend on where exactly you live? Because I live yes. very close to one of London's two television transmitters. So there, there are two. I, I won't say exactly where I live, but one is at Alexandra Palace and the other is at Crystal Palace. And, and they are very powerful transmitters that I, I believe no longer transmit quite as much as they used to. So would my exposure from those big transmitters have been offset in some way by the, the little transmitters that we tend to have around us. If you're very close to them, you're probably not getting much power from them because they tend to shoot over the top of you to reach the people oh. a long way away. What about this transmitter in my hand? Oh, that'd be much oh, more yeah. much more power if you apply yeah. that to your ear. That's the so, that's the most dangerous one that that is uh, anybody has. And but you know the thing about it is five G is so efficient that you need less power coming from this on five G than you do on three G. Am I rightly? This is one of the things I, I do keep trying to get across to people. Is if you have one of these devices here and you're on good old uh, uh, 2G on GPRS and you try and download a movie, it might take you all day. So that's all day this thing is going to be transmitting to you. If you do it on 5G, it might take you a few minutes. So generally speaking, 5G exposes you to a lot, lot less RF radiation than 4G, 3G, 2G does. And let's put that into more perspective because I happen to look at the specifications of the, the current phone that I own, which is a, a Pixel 7 Pro made by Google last year, uh, versus the first ever phone I owned, which was a Motorola MR1. And uh, I, I think the maximum TX power of this Pixel 7 Pro is one quarter of a watt, which is still pretty powerful uh, for a radio transmitter my Motorola MR1, I think it could do a whopping five watts of power. And that was why it had a battery that weighed almost half a kilo. Yeah. So the, the, the thing that, that they, they also don't get, in addition to not understanding the difference between frequency and power, is, is how far you are away from the transmitter and how powerful that transmitter is transmitting. So if you're, if you're, a medium distance away from a really powerful transmitter because it's 3G and it has to send it to a, a big area, you're getting a, a good amount of exposure to that versus if you were to, to turn that off and just have the one outside your house, that's only broadcasting to a short area. So it doesn't have to, a small area, it doesn't have to do it at a high power. So you're, you're getting less uh, exposure because there's less power to it and that's the key but i think the point about the 5g is unlike television which is um on a, on a longer wave so these are more benign waves the 5g the the um the wavelength and the power that's being pushed these wavelengths out 
is much smaller. So the radiation is faster and um, more abrupt. Okay, did he just say that 5G radiation is faster? And more abrupt. It's faster as in... Uh, surely he doesn't mean that 5G travels faster than the speed of light. No, he, he doesn't understand the topic move. at all. <laughs> he he it, he in that clip there he mixed up power and frequency he absolutely mixed yes. them up completely. And what's interesting and as well it, is he talks about uh, uh, 5G be, being shorter wavelengths, but in fact lots of TV transmitters were moved so they could put 5G to make space for 5G. It, it's it's the same frequency. Well, also the part at the beginning where he says it's longer wavelength, so it's more benign. So it's like. Prove your assertion, because you're just making that statement a fact, and it's simply not true. Yeah. There are two things to consider. There's power in terms of the actual radiation flux that's coming from an antenna, and that's different from power per quanta, which is quite an abstract topic for the those who haven't had some exposure to physics. Uh, that's certainly a very abstract that's topic for the Richard Forbes chat show. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's possibly why he's also getting confused as well, because higher frequency is more powerful in terms of one individual radio photon. But that's not what everyone means by transmitter power. But again, it comes to the fact that 4G and 5G are totally different technologies, effectively, because the 5G is this high-powered microwave instead of the 4G, which is, it is a, a more, not so good, but a, l more benign than the 5G. That's my understanding. You know, I'm not an expert in any of this. So Richard Forbes is not an expert in any of this. You may be very surprised to learn that, having encountered those previous clips that I played you. Um, if you are su supremely shocked by Richard's confession not to have any particular qualifications or expertise in... I, I honestly thought the man is, is a genius, the way he explained that. Um, but, but we have it. I, the, the essential difference between 5G and 4G is that 5G is a higher frequency. No. Completely wrong. Poppycock. Codswallop. <laughs> Excrement. We, we, we covered it already uh, in detail. Yeah. That, he that, wasn't uh, listening to the first half of our show, of, was of, he? he uh, just, if only he had. Go back, <laughs> rewind, and now consider what you just said, because you are making some foolish, childlike mistakes that had you paid more attention to Mind of Steel, and not Mark Steele, you might have not made that mistake. So, so well, let's put it this way. If I throw a very high power, large number of softballs at you, that will probably not do very much to you and so forth. And if I fire one low power, but very hard steel ball bearing at your head, which do you want to be hit by? I think I'll pick the softballs, please, Chris. But there's more power in the softballs than the ball bearing because there's uh, lots of softballs and there's only one I ball bearing. I think you're wrong. I've been watching Richard Phobes. He says uh, the opposite of what you just said. What you're saying, Chris, is that, that the ball bearing's 5G and the softballs are 4G. No, I'm saying the ball bearing's a ball bearing. <laughs> it, it's, it's a very common misunderstanding. And people that don't have the background in it should really not be talking about it. Because they, uh, uh, if you don't have the understanding, then stop. Go talk to an expert. Go talk to somebody or get yourself educated on the topic before you talk about it. There's no shortage of free information out there, Richard. You should not talk about it further until you've done the education. If I'm, only no. Richard would take that advice. But um, Richard is famous for interviewing some, some quite questionable people. Now, Richard, as far as I know, has not yet interviewed Mark Steele, but he has interviewed Peace Officer Davey. He's the man who believes that you can magically pay off any debt just by writing a, a handwritten promissory note. He also interviewed uh, Gary Waterman, the, the former police officer, recent Christian and man who believes he has discovered the world's greatest conspiracies, which just turned out to be uh, slight discrepancies on, on the company's house database. So Richard Forbes is not very careful about who he decides to put on his show. But uh, you know, as far if as... I there was something called a national curriculum that actually covered wow. all this stuff in school. So oh, wait a as far as 4G and 5G goes, maybe we could do a, a, a bit of a show about what the actual differences between these things are. 
Ooh, but but, wow. but put it in put it in layman's terms, so it's really easy to understand and digest. So we can just explain why four G isn't five G. This comes back to doing the basic physics about what quantization and power actually mean. I know Richard Forbes loves to interview unusual, spectacular, interesting guests on his more than weekly YouTube show. W would any of you like to, to volunteer to appear as guests on his show and maybe correct some of his misconceptions about 4G, 5G, and, and just radio engineering in general? I'd be I would, happy I'd to do to. it. Yeah, that'd be super fun. <laughs> if Richard isn't offended by uh, our real engineers correcting some of his bizarre misconceptions about the way radio systems actually work, I hope he will consider inviting them all, and myself, onto his panel discussion show. And, and maybe we can lift the vibe of it and provide some technically correct information about how radio systems, including 4G and 5G phone systems, actually work. Well, I shan't be holding my breath, but the, the invitation is now put out there, and, and I do hope to hear from Richard or one of his many, many adoring fans in the near future. In the near future, if you are an adoring fan of Mind of Steel, there are new ways of consuming this exciting content. You can join me on Substack, where you can find some of the newest and oldest episodes of Mind of Steel. In fact, you can get episodes before they are released on YouTube. And also we have the, the time-honored meeting place, the Internet Square, and we, <clears throat> and we also have the 